Chris Duffin here. I am here with Kelly Sarah. Can you believe this? The two of us together, mobility, stability, and uh, we've got some good discussion I think that's going to happen. Today. Yeah, uh, you know, Chris and I have been touching base. I don't know, we've been touching each other tangentially for months now. Yes. And finally, the power of the Mark Bell <laughs> brought us together. And you know, we are West Coasters, which I appreciate. Right? Oh yeah. Which is obviously the origination of all good thinking. So <laughs> the West Coast. But no, seriously, um, this conversation is right time. We're gonna get to this, hang tough, but uh, I, I think at the, the heart and the soul of this conversation is what is the new role, what is the role of the strength conditioning coach, and what should we expect that person to be able to do, right? That's, that's yeah. what we're gonna talk about. It is, and it's, it's something that's shifting and changing because, I mean, if we look at, you know, how athletes are operating today, and there's one, we've got a lot of issues that should, we need to know when we take somebody to the next level of care. When do I send them to see? When do I send them to see the back specialist? But at the same time, there's a lot of things that we should be assessing and putting fixes in place in a regular position so that they never get to the position where they need that care, right? Yeah, totally. It's, it's not skill care. That if you show up and your kneecap is hurts when you squat, and your quads are stiff, and you're missing terminal knee extension, your calves are tight, that is not a skilled care issue, right? That should be dealt with by the strength condition coach and by you as an athlete, right? You need to yeah. care of that. Especially if you're sophisticated enough to be doing conjugate cube, five by five, paleo, back car loading, right? Like you should be able to take care of your main tissues. Yeah, I mean, it's not that complicated. Well, let, let's get into the first one. So, because there's a clear line. There, you say, and we were talking earlier, you said, hey, there's a, there's a point where some, I recognize, I think someone's got something serious going on. Yep. How do you know when that point is? Because this is, I think, one of the big issues is that people don't have a template or a schema to even begin to understand when am I injured? Like so we don't we haven't even defined injury. In fact, most physios, chiros, athletes can't define injury. We can scale injury once we're injured. That's a grade one tear, grade two tear, grade three, right. right? But we don't even have a clear line when someone's injured. So when are you talking about injury? I mean it's you've got to have a platform. Like you've got to know here's the tools I have to apply. Work through them. And if you reach a dead end, you know don't be don't be playing guesswork. So I mean one of the First thing we always go to is we've got to we've got to watch the athlete lift to begin with. Right? Whoa, whoa, whoa! It, You're saying that like that's some context that that's important. <laughs> okay, so because that's a big deal. So you you we've got to, we've got to understand what we're seeing, and I think we're getting better. We're saying that in the last couple of years, especially people become way more sophisticated in understanding what they're saying. It's not just put more weight on the bar and, and pray. Absolutely. So one, you know, do we have a do we have a movement issue in general? Two, are they able to get in the proper position? Do we have some mobility issues and some other things that, oh, here's some principles. I can go uh, go on the, uh, you know, your in one side and go, hey, here's some mobility issues. We can improve the mobility of this, you know, shoulder and get them in position where now they're not, uh, not, not hurting there. Let me ask this, because one of the things that in the professional sports medicine world, there's very little connection, consilience between understanding that poor positioning causes pain. And, I, and for me, that's, that's my goal, that, that, that we, and I don't know if it's because a lot of the movement professionals, a lot of the rehab specialists aren't actually working and watching people move consistently, but you know, you can't take the human body out of context of its movement, especially out of the strength conditioning practice, and say, well then, hey, you turned your, your foot out, your knee slammed in, and that's why, that may be, you know, I don't know why your knee hurts, but. You know, it's weird that you turn your foot out your knee slam. You you can't you can't do anything unless you start with how they're moving big one. I mean that that's that's it's a basic concept. Uh, I mean that and that's for me and that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about is helping our street coaches know how to see deviant movement patterns, what's going on and go, oh, we've got an issue because if you just take it from a you know sitting down, you know, in, in the office and looking at what the problem is, I mean you've got to you've got to you know, assess the whole body to understand, you know, and start getting, piecing together the pieces to figure out why is that knee causing an issue versus, oh, it looks like we're, you know, we're caving in here or I can't get the shoulder in position, that's why my tricep hurts. Instead of just sitting here and treating, we've got tricep problems. Let's treat, we were just talking about this with Mark Bell. You know, tricep, tricep, we gotta fix this. And really, we've got lack of internal rotation, you know, which a lot of it, he's got that lat just kind of tacked down really tight on there that's, a, you know, it's you know, impacting his, uh, you know, scapular mobility and be able to get his position. Okay, so things we're talking about that you're just kind of throwing out there. This is what our mission to 
together with all the other badass coaches is we're going to try really in the next five years make it so these things are so clear to see in the strength conditioning world. Everyone needs to be able to identify them. We're, I think we're getting better at making it clearer, right? But what I really appreciate about, you know, when I watch you treat, like I watch you treat Stan, mm -hmm. even just seeing you think about Your Mark, treat might be the wrong Right, no, bit. I watched you address Stan's movement restrictions, right? That yeah. may have been causing him to not bench 500. Right. right? Um, and I think that's important, you know, semantic, we're gonna have to address. We're gonna have to figure out what is the language then of this. This is strength and conditioning, right? Which yep. means that it's also, I'm responsible for position mechanics. We are getting better at making it a clear one-to-one, -one, but I can see you work with an athlete and I know exactly what you're doing. And, I, and I, none of it doesn't, it doesn't feel voodoo-like, it doesn't feel like gimmicky, like it's straight up restoring mechanics. You know what I mean? Yep. And I think that's where, in this performance side, it's crucial because you're always considering pain is a problem. But really it's about we can't do the things we need to do. And what I have always seen in working with a lot of really good athletes is that when they're moving well, nothing hurts. In fact, they can work even harder and still nothing hurts. It's like an inoculation against dysfunction. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's primary one. Is we talked about this a little bit earlier. I mean, I, I don't want them. I, you know, I've got I've got my uh, subscription website for that covers a lot of corrective issues and a lot of things on coaching movement. You've got a lot of great content on mobility work. In the end, if we move correctly to begin with, we rarely ever need. I want them to do the least amount of your stuff and my stuff totally. as possible. Totally. Uh, let's go into the gym, spend five minutes warming up, and let's start training. Because training correctly is gonna, that's, that is your, that is your, that your prep, I, your I rehab. I could, could, could agree more, right? And what we see is, in places like the NFL, athletes will get eight, eight to 10 minutes of warm up. And what the problem is, we're using our warm up as a time to try to correct our inefficiencies. Don't have full rotation, can't put my arms over my head, can't even get to the bar without sacrificing my, my my T spine, right? Oh, yeah. So no wonder you have to round your back and be pulled because you actually can't get to the bar without rounding your back and be pulled, yep. right? And so, which then drives our disc issue, and now we, uh, right? Now we lose the athlete for a year, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's totally fine because it's normal. So, but the the key here is saying that once your your positions improve, the mechanics improve, it takes very little to maintain them. Yes, you just have to do a little stiffness once in a while. Why? Because I don't think dev humans were ever designed to deadlift as much volume as they're deadlifting. We're, we're striking, yeah. you can, but in the real world, you know, you're probably not walking with the mass on your back hand, which means it only takes a little input. It doesn't take massive amounts. Of exactly. In fact, let me ask you this, because I want to come back to the injury in mind, but how much time do you spend a day working on your tissues and your positions? I don't want, I never want to have somebody doing more than 10 minutes worth of work before a workout. Do you hear that? 10 minutes, like that's it. Dose response. What we want you to do is spend time training, getting into positions, doing skill assessment work or skill assistance or right. positional work. I, I think this is some an area where people also misinterpret like the content that you put out, I put out, the other stuff, and they want to do like 45 minutes worth of prep. Stop it. it. Exactly. Stop it. <laughs> if you're doing that much, there's some basic fundamental issues with probably moving correctly to begin with. You probably don't know how to squat. And you need to fix it. And we, so, we appreciate that, you know, you, you know, so people are ending up down a hallway on fire, right? And they're mm -hmm. like, and they've been moving so poorly for a long time. And I think one of the mistakes is that we realize that people are having to really dig themselves out. And, mm -hmm. and it's much easier. What I can tell you is that the athletes that move the best spend the least amount of time. You know, maybe, like the Chinese lifters are a great example. They move really well, and they do a little smashing on each other. They walk on each other right. a lot, just to restore slide surface so that volume can go up. But otherwise, it doesn't take tons and tons and tons of prep. I do think that when I see highly inflamed power lifters, right, who eat like crap, know who you are, right? <laughs> 14, 14 things to talk about, right? And- uh, I can't find the 13, I'm all right. <laughs> so it's all about dose response and poor warm up, Poor cool down, no aerobic work, right? Super stiff, and just put a thousand pounds on your back, you're gonna get stiff, right? Yep. So, but but we should be able to program to that, and it should still take more than ten minutes of, of monkey around. It absolutely. Okay, so back to injury because this is an important concept because one of the things that 
let's just call it for-profit medicine or, or sports medicine world is concerned about is that strength conditioning coaches are handling injuries and trying to treat injuries. So let's define it. For me, an injury is I can no longer perform my movement or occupy my role in society or do my job on the team. Right. So I can't squat, right? I, if I can squat and I have knee pain, I'm not saying you're injured. I'm saying you have a, an incident that we need to take seriously, but that's still not an injury, right? Because I know how many athletes are working in pain and around pain, a lot. Yep. And a lot never actually let anybody know about it because they're worried that they're gonna be the traditional response. Well, let's not train and let's do some of these remedial movements for the next month and then we can get you back to it. And they want to avoid that at all costs. But, and, so, and they've had an experience where they spent their whole lives strength conditioning, being very serious about it, being very sophisticated about it, then something happens, get injured or, or whatever. Then they end up in this, this rehab hole in a completely foreign language of not hard work, of not assistance, of, of, and that doesn't even correlate well, right? I'm laying on the table. You know, there was a meme that showed up on my physical therapy feed it was like for P private PT practice, and it was a person laying on a table, like a stick figure, and then the other stick figure was moving their knee around. And I was like, what is that? That's not physical therapy, that's like moving someone's knee around. I mean, and I think that's the, the one mistake, is when we're seeing that the language of strength conditioning does, isn't congruent currently, or the language rehab is congruent with that. And so athletes are hiding their problems, or yep. waiting until they're very severe, because we haven't empowered coaches, we haven't empowered athletes to take care of them. Yep. Yeah, and, and we see that a lot. I mean, just uh, I was telling you about, uh, you know, recently at the College Strength and Conditioning Conference, had a bunch of coaches come up and they're like, that's a great product, but, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't touch that. I'll get in trouble. You know, it's, and, and like, it, what's different about that and grabbing a foam roller and having the athlete lay on it? It's just another way of addressing some very simple things. If we've got some restrictions, we can deal with it, we move forward. But, you know, if we suspect we've got a, you know, an AC joint issue or a torn rotator cuff, you know, you're not going to play around with that. You're yeah, and you can't, you can't fix it. Exactly. Right. And one of the ways that I think we'll both agree that you know is that you've taken things off the table. You know, you've gotten in to the thoracic spine. You've gotten into the latinus radius. You've cleaned up the things that you know you can clean up, and it didn't improve the problem. Right? And that's exactly. something we want people to know is that working on your own body and addressing your tissues and being able to identify what's normal and not normal is part of the strength and conditioning practice. And when you clear those things up and it still has it, then you need to move it up. Exactly. Just like Mark, you know, he's got he's got some issues, right? Like, well we've got his latch attack down. Let's let's spend a little time loosening those up. Boom. We can alleviate a lot of things that could end up leading to a surgery because he tore his tricep down the road. <laughs> right? I, yeah, I don't, he's not going to try to benching 600 all the time, missing 100% of this intro rotation mark. And uh, this is twice now that two of your good friends have pointed out you're missing intro rotation as the problem. And this is, this is I, I want to say, is this isn't a coach's fault, and this is Mark's fault. Everyone's a product of a system, yep. and they come through. But now we need to put a, a flag in the, in the sand and say, this is when it changes, and this is what we expect you to be able to identify and see and not see. Because you know, if you can see the same problem, it's, it's just screaming at you. I see the same problem, it's screaming, and Mark hasn't seen it, which means that we haven't done a good job, a good enough job of explaining it to Mark, right? Or, right. or, or Mark's training partners to say, what the hell, Mark? Yeah. Actually, I actually pulled his training partners in the room while we were going through it yesterday and said, here's what we're seeing, here's what I would, here's, here's how we'd approach that. Yeah, and, so, and that's, because that's, that's the, that's right. right. They need to hold them accountable, too. Yep. And they're, they're the pretty, so if you go to almost any Eastern Bloc training, athletes are touching other athletes, you know, like, you know, we're afraid to put our hands on them, like, athletes are like, hey, I'm grisly there, you know, or it's not working right, and like, someone just grabs you and moves you around. It doesn't yep. even have to be, like, the most skilled. We have more pictures that are sent to us from the Chinese training hall of athletes walking on each other, smashing, like, there's the gold medalist, yep. smashing the other gold medalist. You know, and it's and it's normal because they know what it feels like and what it should feel like. Yeah. And and if that doesn't get the response, like what you can tell is tight, I'm not I'm not able to get you anywhere. Like I in my facility I still have an in-house massage service that works there. We don't try to like take their business away or to have people not go. It's just a point of like, well, can we spend five minutes doing it in our warm-up and address it? If not, we need to go here. Maybe they need some ART, maybe they need, you know, whatever whatever that approach is to get that, uh, that dealt with. 
you have done, and, and I think people are maybe worried that we're trying to eliminate that. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know where the, the fear comes from. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> watch someone deadlift poorly, you can have some fear. Not because they're going to get hurt then, but we know you're going to get stiff. And it comes, so that's the issue. I mean, how many bad lifts have you seen in your time? Oh my God. Did people's necks blow up spontaneously on the spot? No. No. But what we know is in the long haul, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Even if tissue restriction, right? Because your body's compensating for some of those positions. That, and you know, if you're all turtling and you pull there, you, you think that's going to affect your bench press? It is. And that's Absolutely. the problem because we can't, we're not, we haven't been clever enough or we haven't conjoined the, tra the strength training positioning with mechanics. Yeah. What we've said is, hey, you know, we're really good at conjugate and I can do 27 different thousand squats, but I don't understand what I'm doing with my squat. Exactly. I mean, we can, we can talk programming theory all day long, but number one, first you've got to be moving well. And if you're not moving well, as a coach, you should be, actually be able to know just from watching that, that, oh, we may have a restriction in the glute, we may have, again, you know, this lat issue, internal rotation, we may have, you should be able to see that in the movement. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put a flat, that, that's huge for me. Yeah. Like, if I watch somebody squat, I can tell you almost everything about what's going wrong with their body. And what I would say is, um, every master coach I know can see the restrictions in the movement, but they the old generation of guys didn't know how to fix it. They would just right. be like, well, we'll just we'll do all these assistance work exercises. A, a billion drills to try to work around the problem without necessarily ever addressing the problem. Um, one of the, the people who are doing the best right now is Coach Dan Pfaff out at uh, Altus, which used to be the World Athletic Center in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Phoenix. They're going to put about 45 Olympians into the Olympiad this year. But they have what they call trackside therapy, when they treat all their coaches to be able to assess and also do some manual assessment and also some simple soft tissue work as a background because the athlete comes in and says, hey, I can't do this or I'm not hitting this or I can't get into this shape. They can fix it and put it right back out. That's perfect. That's, that's the process of how it should be working. <laughs> Let me ask you something. If you're, if you're warming up with squat, and it's nice is that you, uh, if you haven't seen Chris Duffin squat or dead, you should. It's really it's fun to watch. <laughs> it's always fun to watch big strong guys move well. But, um, if you're moving under the bar, you're hot and sweaty, you're building heat, and it's not going, will you fix it between sets? Will you yes, work? absolutely. Do you see that? That means because we just found out some information yeah. about how we're moving, and then we can fix it. So part of the movement is, the, the, the warm-up is as an assessment. Like, and sometimes we may do some simple things too, like maybe I'll do a little bit of goblet squatting before I go in. Oh, I've got this issue going on here. Boom, jump, do, you know, work a fix. Then go back and go, oh, I'm going to goblet squat again really quick. You know, did I make change? I did. Okay, now let's move to our warm-ups. You know, did it, and, and am I still having this restriction? You know, I might be doing some overhead RRT squats to open up because, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not being able to get in position. I've got a lot of tightness pulling into my, you know, and in on my elbows. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's in the process. All right. I'm squatting, I'm fixing, test. Back and forth. That, that is the, the, the heart and soul of what we're trying to do is, you know, we're dividing, and we call this the I3 model. The first is I have incomplete mechanics, and I can work with those incomplete mechanics, but I'm leaving force on the table, I'm not making it about performance, right? When I optimize position and mechanics, I get better expression of force transfer, period, right? Yes, I mean, that, that's what That's ultimately what we're caring about, yeah. right? And I, I, I love, I have to go into that all the time because a lot of people that I, you know, I'm trying to get the word to, right? They're still in their early 20s, and uh, I think it's like, you're, you're, you're gonna make me safer, get me out of pain. I don't, I don't have pain. I'm fine. <laughs> well, let's wait a little while. So I'm like, you're leaving performance on the table. How? Oh! <laughs> I mean, hey, coach. What? <laughs> that's right. And when you can join that for people, I think that's actually one of the things we've found is the most important experience is that when we put athletes in better positions with tissues that move, they express more force. And then the cycle, yep. like it's 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 conjoined. So people suddenly are like, oh, well, I know what I'm doing before I deadlift because it makes me lift. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's, this is basic, you know, neurological stuff, right? That if you don't have great core stability or proper joint concentration, your body is going to try to protect you. It's going to deregulate so that you're, you're you can't illicitly, you know, put out the proper, the maximal force. So if you take care of those things, get joints in proper position, stabilize correctly, you're gonna see 
not a performance increase, you're going to see what your actual performance is because before you're, you're basically under training. That's right. I mean, so we work through the stuff and it's like, you're 400 pounds water, let's fix it. Today you're a 440 pounds water, you never knew it. Yeah, you know, I think it's Dave Tate who said things like, you know, he, his, he really likes cleaning up people's technique, which is about cleaning up their position yep. and seeing the massive gains quickly. You know, you go from, you know, 400 point pull to, you know, like you said, 460 just because you, you didn't, didn't sacrifice your spine. Yep. People are like, this is amazing. I'm like, well, actually, you, just, you were always there. Always there. But think, about, think about that from a performance aspect. I mean, if you were always there and you weren't training to that level for the last six months, where would you be yet? And this is uh, this is crucial because we have a bunch of physios who are going to listen to this, and you know our experience working on the performance side is that position drives performance, that position inoculates us, and the problem is, and we're going to try to drag the rehab staff back, is that we can't necessarily tell us a straight story because you know people I get hammered all the time about posture. Like people are like, there's no research that posture causes pain, right? And I'm like, well, there is great research that shows that posture, poor posture affects your breathing, affects your ability to pull. I mean, you know what I mean? And I think it's because if we don't scale that conversation up on your load and intensity, you can see how you come to believe a certain fallacy about yeah. it doesn't really matter if you round your back and you pick things up off the ground. What matters at some point, and at some point, it's easier for us to just teach you to keep picking everything up off the ground yeah. and back flat. I, I, I was uh, just working with a, uh, uh, a girl earlier this week. Posture, she's rounding at the thoracic, right? She's got no pain with it. No pain with the posture. But all of a sudden, you know, she's, while, I'm, while I'm squatting and deadlifting, you know, my, all of a sudden something will happen and I lose, I can't walk for a couple of days. And this bad, like, neural shutdown. None of the doctors, nobody's been able to figure it out for me. So we worked through some stuff and improved her posture. She was limited in basically thoracic extension as well. Uh, but that posture was also, you could see some issues going on in the core because she was compensated with overactive abdominals. And are you listening? So, so we worked on the posture, worked on, you know, worked on her breathing patterns and how she used her core. And all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, that, I can feel it coming today because I can see the feel, the, the, the sensation in my glute that I normally feel. Prior to leading it up, I'm like, well, let's squat. Let's see what happens. And no issues. So I'm going to make sure she continues to report back to me. But the posture did not cause any pain. Yeah, and that's the that's squatting right. deadlift caused kind of pain. That's right. And it's <laughs> but that, and that's why we think it's much easier to teach kids. This is what your spine looks like when you just do simple hinging. This is what your spine looks like when you pick your shoes up off the ground. Because also in that moment of load, when you're the load is squeezing your head. Like I was just saying, you know, I'm doing a little pobble, you know, down with progression, you know, because I just need someone to program down with right. me. So one heavy session a week. But I was just doing fives last week and I can't hear anything. Like I'm really trying to hear what's going on in my body, but when I'm doing fives on deadlifts, half and go, it's really hard for me to hear anything. And to be sensitive and aware of, hey, I you know I didn't finish that or I flared and my lats yeah. turned off or I couldn't, you know what I mean? And that's the problem. It's really difficult for people to, to hear this and be cognitively aware of when they're in the reverse. And that's why your default position and learned positions and learned responses matter because those are, that's where you're going to go to. Yeah. Under stress, big competition, fatigue, you're going to always default to what you train. Yep. And, that's, uh, like, and there's so many things from that awareness standpoint. And that's where I use like, a lot of like, the corrective tools. Like I said, I don't want people doing like, a whole lot of stuff before they warm up. But there's a lot of stuff to be bringing postural awareness and to practice some of these positional stuff on your off days as well. And just bring that awareness and that practice and it just becomes second in nature. And that's a big piece of uh, big piece of my movement website, which to me, I, I think is really complimentary oh, to, to what you're doing. We, it's we, like, I, I have tried to stay out of the corrective game because people like you are there, Greg Cook is there. Like we have a bunch of friends who are really, really competent in that. And I'm just like, hey, let's, let's go to your tissue restriction. Yep. And, and by the way, this is also what we think good moving looks like. And, and, and that's, but we, we've, I've stayed out because I'm like, look, I have friends who are really good at this. And people confuse. And I'm just saying that like, you just open the joint, you're done. And that's not true. No, no I, I think the two pieces are, but you, can't, but you can't have proper movement if you're not able to get the joint in proper position to begin with, right? So they're, they're, you need both of these. 
they're both together. Yeah, and, but that's and my expertise is on the movement side, and so like I have very little content on like, what you're doing because guess what? You need you need to work on that stuff. Go here. Yeah. So that, you're going to see more and more of this overlap happen. Where you know, yesterday one of my strength coaches who was also DPT, he's working on his snatch. You know, and at the top, at the top moment, his glute just shuts down, and he comes in, right? So yep. he's already he's pulling too wide because he's looking for stability. When he comes narrower, suddenly he's up in his ankle restriction, and then we so we improve that. But then all of a sudden, I'm like, hey, you're missing all your internal rotation in your hip, right? Inflection. It's like, how'd you know? Like, well, when you hit that spot, you bounce off the wall. The first thing I do is I throw a hip circle on him and make him just do good mornings. Right. A hip circle, and he's like, it looks like I when I get to that spot, it's, it's flat. It's like it's an empty void. I'm like, that's where your brain, and that is the role of corrective exercises. Yep. To teach skills and to reconnect those things. Yep. Right? Skill, position, transfer exercises. But once we do that, we want to go back to your snatch and actually ingrain that pattern in. Because you've got to have got to have training to stimulate a response, right? It's not the same thing as you know taking your 60-year-old non-active person and you know assigning them a corrective. Guess what? That's actually training them. Because they have, so they're going to see a response from your DPT who actually lifts. It's not going to see any response. That's just going to help him turn on and get it moving the right direction. But then he's got to go snatch again. Right. That's right. And this is where we we're, we're going to do a better job in the next couple of years of really giving people simple recipes. You're never going to do it as well as Chris. You're never going to do it as well as some of the masters. But you don't have to do it as well. Because you can get 80 to 90 percent. You're going to fix and nail all the problems. We have to make it so ubiquitous that it's not just more squats solve the problem, because that's not the case, right? Sometimes yeah. we have to identify what the movement problem is and then say, is there a tissue restriction underneath that? Yep. Now, you address that there's some ding on us because we don't talk about pain very much, right? Yet, yep. you know, when I watch you work on Stan, and we'll put the link on the Stan's shoulder, you're like, hey, let me desensitize this tissue a little bit, right? Can you talk about just how you think about chronic pain? Uh, so, sometimes chronic pain is just underlying like remnants of some past issues, right? So Stan's been training for his whole life. He's probably been training for 30 years. He's the strongest human being. He's the most shredded human being in the state. Yes. So, so uh, actually that's what we uh, use a, a lot of the learning here on here is we'll just, if, if, if it's, we can kind of identify if it's, you know, something that's just a peripheral nerve sensitization versus a bigger issue that needs some Maybe I need to refer them out to uh, to someone to take a look at, but not just taking care of the tissue restriction, but we're you know just basically kind of pulling the fascia and the skin and just having a shearing effect. A lot of times that'll clear up some of those issues. It's very simple, easy to test. If you get results, move on. If you don't, send them on to someone else that can dig deeper. But why would I why would I send somebody out for shoulder pain if I can spend spend thirty seconds you know you know desensitizing the, the peripheral nerve system and yeah, and, and the problem's gone, right? So, how many, you are a competitive athlete, how many, like, one of the things that, are the beefs that I have seen in the world with some movement, breathing people, is people are like, I don't have time for that. I, I, I gotta lift and train and still manage my kids. I can't, like, I would tell my wife, like, if I was like, Juliet, I've got two hours of practice. So she'd be like, uh huh. That's where I go. Do you think that we can get all of this done in a training session? Absolutely. So it's, it's, I mean, I do this all the time. This is what our coaches do. So in our coaching staff works with virtual clients all the time. Um, I, I mentor a lot of strength and conditioning coaches in college, pro, like, you know, in powerlifting as well. Uh, this is, uh, you should not be spending too much time. Especially since take the high hitters, right? We're, very and we're, not, we're not squatting, deadlifting, good morning, benching, pressing, dip, like it's not everything every day. There's only so much you're going to get done in a session anyway. Let's focus on those movements. Yeah. And, and pick the high hitters. Like if we've got 20 different things, you know, what's the top three? And let's work on those. Get them down and move to the next one. Yeah, if it's, if it's beyond your scope, you know, get some help. But that's, you can be amazed at how much you, you can do, but you should not be spending 45 minutes worth of prep time for 30 minutes of training. You should be spending 10 minutes of prep time. And you know, maybe if you've got a lot of issues on your off day in between, you know, maybe you got 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes at the max right. at home doing some body weight stuff at home. And even, I, I'm like, look, you 
know that 10 minutes you watch, you watch TV, TV before you go to bed? Exactly. That's what that's for. Not the training session. Exactly. Don't sit on the couch. Get get down on the floor, do some work, you know, do some, you know, work. maybe you're doing some box squats on the couch. Love you know, it doesn't, yeah. Love it. Pavel was, uh, I just saw a thing. He was saying, he's, he's like, I don't even want to see you stretching at the gym. That's what the gym's for. It's like, don't, don't make these soft exercises. Come to the gym with intention to train, right? Yep. And, and you can see that he's not saying, don't work out your positions, but he's like, like quit being all soft and we're like, come on, let's be serious what we're doing. So yeah, it, so anytime we have like mobility work, what we do is we do that like the day before, mm -hmm. the night before, or on your off day. Then you come in and you start prepping the movement. Now, if you encounter an issue, you may have to put something in in between those sets and go, boom, let's clean this up really quick. And the goal is that you've already done that. Let me just say that one of the things that we do is we talk about either prepping for the next day's movement or I just trained and learned something about myself, so I fix it after, after the session. Which yeah. means I've already had my next session. Exactly. Right. So I bench, I had a problem with my bench, I fixed some aspect of my bench, and then I bench two days later or three days later anyway, so it's probably already fixed. But yeah, if you waited until the next bench session to address it, you're, you're lazy. Uh, you're marking up. <laughs> <See you. laughs> all right, all right. So um, let's um, let's wrap this. Is awesome. We can talk. I mean, this is this is so important, and this is the next revolution. This is the next wave of revolution. Um, all my people. We're at Mobility Wad, WOD, right? And yep. our, our library and exercise the best the stuff is there. How do people find you? Who, who need to know who you? Uh, so our movement website is Kabuki. K A B U K I dot M S, uh, or you can just go to our main website. It's linked there, but KabukiStrength.com. I want I want to say um, we had a, a games level athlete come into the gym recently. She's been having knee pain, deep squatting, um, especially on the pistol. It's been happening since December, so she's totally sensitized. Like she's got four months of just this thing. MRI is clear, back is clear. Check 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 check. Everyone's miffed. Turns out her quads are so stiff. They're brutally stiff. And I'm like, when I push on her quads, she like barfs and blocks out. And I'm like, well, maybe that's related, right? Because it's connected to your kneecap, right? Okay. And I sent her away with your, um, you know, she looks like a baby. Yeah. You know, I was like, hey, look, I need you to take this and try to work on this. And uh, but your roller, I love, because I need that geisha roller. Is, it's so, it's beefy enough, frankly, that Yes, yeah, so that's we sell products that help people do some of this work at home. So we've got the big geisha roller, which is a combo effort between me and Donnie Thompson using this body tempering, but just a passive way of putting some load for you know dispersed load for a longer period of time on the tissue. And we see great results in our in our, our trained athletic population with this. Trained athletic population. So, that's right. So uh, don't don't be because like anytime you want to be talking results, just come to our I try. I finally had to say to all the physios, I'm like, hey, look, you guys in the UK, especially, you know who you are. I was like, you need to come and train with us and see what we're doing. Yeah. And when they come to town, I'll call Chris or we'll go up to Chris Jim, and then we'll we'll start just swinging problems out and we'll show us show us how you're solving the problems. Because right. if you can get a faster result than we're getting and actual results, then we'll talk. Yeah. And it's uh, what we found is just really long lasting results from some of these products like the, the Geisha roller on that quad. Uh, I don't it's know, easy. Yeah, I, it, it's very easy. You can watch. We put uh, Tim Hasselbeck uh, um, right on and just, just smoke. Well, Matt Hasselbeck actually just sat there, and Tim was there, but Matt just sat there and smoked his quads all the time. Whole time. Excellent. Loves it. <laughs> all right. Uh, KabukiStrength.com. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, we're gonna just take a quick pause, and then I want you to talk about this beautiful thing. Okay. All right.